Can you hear me? I really don't want to hold this. Can you hear me? You can't hear me? See y'all later. <laughs> um, can you hear me? I don't think it's working. Yeah, you can. You got to hold it up. Top. Uh, uh, can you? Okay. Um, yeah, I don't like these microphones. Can we cover these up? These are this media, right? No, let me just say this. Um, when I speak to clubs, I'm just pretty kind of honest and cut up. So I'm just going to ask the media if I say something and you put it out there, please don't set me up to be all over social media. Because I really do have fun speaking. I say things. I tell jokes. Don't anybody get offended. Um, God, you got a big room. I can't look all of you in the eyes. You're too far away. Um, we had a pretty good year. Um, I'm, really, I'm really not prepared to give some kind of speech. I don't ever write speeches. I take notes and just speak from my heart. But it was two years ago uh, when I was hired. And I was bold enough to go to that PMAC and make everybody look at those Final Four banners and challenge myself and all of you to help us put a championship banner up there. Ooh, got that monkey off my back. <laughs> um, it's crazy. I don't know how to explain what we've done in two years. The transfer portal obviously helped us. It helps everybody, but it also hurts people too. Uh, we're still in the transfer portal. It's a part of what we do every day now. It's like free agency in baseball. Uh, you work a lifetime to recruit young people and just for no reason, they can go somewhere else. Well, we're either going to have to embrace that or you're going to get left behind, kind of like the NIL stuff. Right. Uh, but I do want to ask you something. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play uh, judge and jury here. You ready? Yep. Raise your hand if you bought those season tickets I told you you should buy back then. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. Keep them up. Keep them up. Okay, put them down. Now, those of you who didn't raise your hand. Yep, yep, get them up high. Okay, now my question to those of you who didn't, why in the hell didn't you? <laughs> didn't win enough? Not an LSU fan? You live here, right? You live here. We're all a part of this community. And I tell people, if you don't support things that go on into your community, then don't complain and bitch about things that are not good. Yeah. The yeah. first thing up here it says, is it the truth? Yeah. Is it the truth? I speak a lot of places, and I do say this. So when I saw that, I thought, hmm, that might be part of my talk today. In my opinion, the biggest problem in our country today is people lie. That's the, it goes all the way up to the president. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. <laughs> well, what in the hell was it? <laughs> right? <laughs> the truth. So when I recruit, I sit in those homes and I look at moms and dads and grandmas and I'll say, look me in the eye. Because this is your chance to ask me anything you want. But once I coach your kid, I'm not talking to you about basketball. Because you can't ever keep them all happy. I'll talk to your kid always about basketball. But you will always get the truth out of Mulkey. Always. It might not be sugar-coated when I tell it to you. But I have no agendas. I love what I do. I was talked into being a coach by the former president at Louisiana Tech. He wouldn't take no for an answer. And here I am 40, almost 40 years later. My degree was in business administration. I was working on my MBA after the 84 Olympics, and he calls me up to the 16th floor of Wiley Tower. Any Louisiana Tech grads in here? You know where Wiley Tower is. And I thought something bad had happened. Because when you send police to your classroom, it's not usually good. And I got up there, and he just he wouldn't let me leave until I agreed to be a coach with Leon Barmore for a year. And here I am, uh, almost 37, 38 years later. That man saw something in me that I really didn't see in myself, but what he saw was a leader. He saw leadership ability. He watched me play. A lot of you watched me play and grow up in this state. And this is why I came back. 
I had seen from afar, I had played against some of the best women's players at LSU. My first championship in 2005, we beat Simone Augustus, Tamika Johnson, and Sylvia Fowles, by far more talented than our Baylor team. And I saw this, and I said, I can go back home. This is the last third of my career. I can go back home, and I don't have to reintroduce myself to people that have known me since I played Dixie Youth Baseball. And it's just been, I keep looking at my daughter at the Final Four, and I go, Mackenzie, Mama, am I about to die? <laughs> she goes, Mom, don't say that. I said, this is, this is, I've done this before, but it's too quick. It's too, um, it's not easy, but it, 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 this is nuts. Guys, what we have done in two years, I don't know how to tell you we did it, but we did it. And we did it with you, with the fans. Those of you who were in Dallas, raise your hand. Holy smokes. I have been doing this a long, long time. And I'm telling you, the tickets were hard to get. They were more expensive than the men's tickets in Houston. The ratings are off the charts. I even had my former coach, Barmore, call me and he goes, I need to ask you something. I said, what you got, coach? He said, Kim, why do you think the ratings are what they are? And I said, I have a lot of uneducated guesses and I'll give that to you. And I'll share with you what I said. I said, you had four good teams there that were well coached and they were good games. So that's one thing that will draw your attention. If you're just an average fan that doesn't really keep up with women's basketball, you might have turned the TV on and went, and you might have stayed in front of that TV. The second thing I think it is, is social media. You now have girls trash talking and doing this, and that brings a lot of people to the TV. And I just think those kinds of things attract people that may never have been interested in women's basketball before. And I'm telling you, it's people that I'm laughing at now because it was always, ah, it's girls, they play below the rim. And I always told my buddies, I told them two things when I was growing up. I said, come out here and play with us and you'll have a different perspective. Come play with us sometime. And number two, when you're looking for a wife, you might better look along these lines or you're going to be a miserable dad watching Little League later in life. Okay, y'all go figure it out. <laughs> um, what I'd like to do, because I'm rambling, I am so damn happy, I am rambling. I'm going to let you guys ask me questions. Nothing is off limits. Just be prepared for the answer you might not want to hear. <laughs> Fair enough? So get your sequin jacket on. If you've got the kahanas of an elephant to wear it next year, wear it. Okay? And ask me any question that you would like, because I find that a little bit more entertaining than a speaker, that y'all might have something you're just curious about. All right. In the back, back here. Yes? Speak loud. Is Louisville going to be unhappy next year? Well, we don't play them, if that's what you mean, in case we're beating them. And I'll leave it at that, all right? And those of you who don't know what he's talking about, that's your problem. Yes, sir. We are allowed 15, he wants to know how many scholarships do we have and we filled them all. I have 15 scholarships every year. The men have 13. Uh, they may be trying to get more. That's NCAA rules. Uh, I can't tell you, Joe, count up on your fingers how many we lost, how many we signed in the early recruiting uh, period, and how many transfers. I promise you this, I won't go over 15. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. What was the biggest challenge you faced and how did you overcome it? Oh, the biggest challenge in my life that I faced and how did I overcome it? I'm going to answer this off the top of my head. And then when I leave, there may be something that comes to mind. 
Um, let's start back when I grew up. Integration hit. I was going into the second grade. I'm seven, is that about right, seven years old. And I go to school thinking I'm going to see the same people in the classroom. Uh-oh, they're all gone. All the white people left the public schools in Tanchepo Parish. And there I sat. Cousins left. So seven years old, I'm thinking, I don't understand this. So I went back home. Leave. We grew up in the country. Mom, where is cousin so-and-so? Where is cousin so-and-so? And she sat me down as a little girl and explained to me what was going on in our country. And I cannot tell you the impact that that had on me and made me who I am. I was bust from second grade at Mooney Avenue to third grade at Pine Ridge to fourth, fifth, and sixth grade at Crystal Springs, seventh grade, Annie Eastman, eighth grade, the junior high, and when I got to the ninth grade, exactly what my mother said would happen, happened. Everybody came back to the public schools. See, people don't like change, and it scares people. My mother said, you stayed in those public schools because it was the right thing to do, and the best teachers were in the public schools. That made me who I am. The second thing I would say to you would be when I was kicked out of a dugout during the All-Star Games in Dixie Youth Baseball. <laughs> I uh, played Dixie Youth Baseball and made the All-Star team as a pitcher, catcher, and a shortstop. And no, for you guys, I didn't have to wear a cup when I was catching. Um, I know you wanted to ask me that, right? And now your wife's going, what is she talking about? <laughs> We went to Ponchatoula. Anybody here from Ponchatoula? Yep. Tanchepo Parish, Hammond, Ponchatoula, big rivals. And um, my dad got wind, obviously, that I was going to not be able to play that game. And they were trying to say it was a clerical error, how they wrote it on the um, registration. They listed me as an alternate. I wasn't an alternate, I can assure you that. <laughs> but make a long story short, they uh, stop, we're doing in and out before the game, and um, they bring me to the dugout. And my dad had not told me anything, but I see these TV cameras, and I see all these women gathered around, and these men, and so they proceed to tell me that I'm not going to be able to play in this game. And I said, what's going on? And they explained it to me. It was because I was a girl. Let's just lay it out there. Um, and I said, you know what? No problem. I'll sit right here in the dugout. Well, then it was, you can't sit in the dugout. Oh, boy. So I take my all-star hat, and I pull it down because I feel the knot coming in my throat. And I'm one of these that I don't show much emotion. And when I do, I'm an ugly crier. <laughs> and I get out of the dugout, and I stood there. And Dad said, they either play the game, and we fight it later in the courts, or we stop this game, and they don't play. Well, that's a no-brainer. My, uh, no, I'm not punishing my teammates. Let them play the game. So that would be another life experience of discrimination and things that happened. Uh, but I've been blessed. I lost uh, a grandchild. My first grandchild was stillborn. My daughter had to deliver a, a basically a, a dead child. At, you know, she had Turner syndrome. So that's something, if you don't know what Turner syndrome is, Google it. 98% die in the womb, little girls. Uh, it's not hereditary. It's just we all deal with things like that. So I have had all the same ex divorce. Probably the toughest thing I've ever had to deal with was divorce. Uh, would have given up my career to save my family, but it just didn't work out. And yet um, I'm a big believer in family and uh, marriage. Uh, so I've had a little bit of everything that you all have. Nothing's any different. I just am a fighter, and I just keep plugging away, and I'm not afraid to share things. A lot of people are private. I'm private with my time, but if you don't share your life's experiences with others and help them along the way, then what do you do? You just take it to your grave, and that's not any good. So I just share things. There's nothing off limits with me. Yes,
We have a dream team. These are, these are students at LSU. They have to go through the NCAA clearinghouse just like any student athlete does. And we use them as practice players. We will, like, let's say we're getting ready to play South Carolina or we're getting ready to play anybody, and we assign each one of them, this is who you are this week. This is her move. This is what she does. And I use that not to take away from my uh, bench players. I am a better coach when I have all of my players here as if I'm studying in the game and I don't have to use them as the scout team. And they are absolutely phenomenal. And it gets very competitive. There are many times I have to tell them, son, son, I don't have a scholarship for you, chill. <laughs> I'm talking like they want to dunk it and they're pushing Angel and Angel's getting right back at him. I like some of that, it's good. But I mean, you want guys like that. We have a ton of them. And because some can't come on certain days because of their class schedule, but those guys, a lot of them were at the Final Four. Uh, they, they're, we're going to get them rings like we get, uh, whatever the NCAA will allow. Those guys are so proud, and I'll tell you why I'm, I love those guys. Not many men, guys, I have a son, got an ego as big as Texas, okay? But he grew up in a house with a strong mama. And he understands how valuable it is to respect women and especially women that can get out there and compete with you. And for those guys to come out there and do what they do for our team and, and get something out of it, the tears, I, I just have this visual of one of them, he just grabbed me coming off the floor in Dallas. And I, I'm sure he probably had a few little Bud Lights or Miller Lights or, you know, in him. Because I don't think he would normally say this. And he just grabbed me and he said, what they going to say now, coach? <laughs> That's just love. That's just, I did this. We did this. We helped you, coach. And if you ever come watch us practice, you're welcome to come. You'll see them there. You will see them there every day. And we coach them just like... I coach my own. So love those guys. We call them the dream team. Yes, sir. So I can reflect on your comment about I did marry a college athlete, so softball, volleyball, and, and it's a lot easier. But my question is, in the media, other coaches, I know some people make shots that you're successful because of resources. Other coaches weren't. But who in the your coaching profession do you really – look up to and that are still coaching that you can have a good friendship with? None. <laughs> My mentors and people who taught me this great game were Pat Summit and Leon Barmore. Yep. The details, Barmore's still alive, Pat is not. It is hard to have best friends in the business because somewhere along the way, you're going to recruit the same player and you're going to get mad at each other. Somewhere along the way, uh, you're going to, to disagree on things that happen in the sport. My personality, honestly, I have trust issues. I have trust issues. I don't know if it was because of integration. I don't know if it was because getting kicked out of a dugout. I don't know if it's because of divorce. But I don't tell people a whole lot. My circle of friends is very small. I have tons of acquaintances. I love all of y'all, your acquaintances. <laughs> but people who truly know me um, is very small. And it's not because I have anything to hide. I don't hide anything. You need my computer, here's the code. You need my phone, here's the code. There's nothing that I hide. It's just, I don't, I just don't tell a whole lot. So in this business, I don't drink. Now this is going to blow y'all's mind. I would never had a drink in my life and grew up down here. Yeah. Yeah. Grew up here. Y'all know we put beer in the bottles for the babies now, okay? 
But I know why I don't drink. It has nothing to do with religion. I have put more drunk people to bed in my life, and I thought when they wake up tomorrow and I tell them what they did, they are going to think I'm lying. <laughs> and then I thought, I love to eat. God, I love to eat. <laughs> if I ever found a, 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 an alcohol that I liked, I might be dead <laughs> because I love to eat. So I am a big Barks root beer in a bottle person. You can drop Barks root beer at my house all you want. Don't send me the cans. Don't like the fountain. It's got to be in the bottle. And then a small bottle Coke. So that's my vice, whatever you want to call it. And don't bring me coffee. I've never had coffee in my life. It stinks. <laughs> it smells like tuna fish to me. <laughs> And I'm not supposed to say this, right? Because community coffee is big here. All my friends own these little coffee shops. Kim, no, don't bring it. I don't do it. <laughs> so that's me. To answer your question, I got off track here, but I don't. I, I do have a couple friends. The, the lady at, at Alabama, she and I coached together at Louisiana Tech. Georgia Tech, Nell and I coached mm -hmm. together. There are many that we coached together. But um, I just, my, my, Mentors are going to be the older coaches that I learned from. Yes. So, Kim, what's the story behind Jasmine? Jasmine Carson. Yeah. If you haven't seen it, go buy her shirt. It says, Stay Ready. Yeah. I can't tell you where to go. I'm not into all that, but find it because she's making a little money on Stay Ready. Jasmine Carson had been at West, uh, excuse me, at Georgia Tech, out of high school. She left Georgia Tech and went to West Virginia. And then when I got the LSU job, she came to play for me. I've coached a lot of great players. She is the second best shooter, three-point shooter, that I've ever coached. And ironically, the, the best perimeter three-point shooter I coached was the MVP as a sophomore in the national championship game in 2005. And then this kid basically goes and wins this game for us in 2023. She just, the flick of the wrist. And for her to uh, handle it so beautifully when I made the change in the playoffs to have her coming off the bench versus starting, it had nothing to do with her being in a slump or anything. It was body. I wanted a bigger body on the floor when we played the first and second rounds here, particularly against Michigan. So I put Kateri Poole in, and I said, you know, I'm going to leave this lineup like it is. I think it will relax Jasmine. And she's, you know, she comes in the Michigan game, hits three or four, kind of separates us from those guys. And then what she did in that uh, championship game, and it wasn't just her. Coaches coach a lifetime. Coaches coach a lifetime, and they never win championships. Some of the best ones to ever coach the game. That's how hard it is. And coaches think of that moment in their career where you can say, that game, everybody peaked. Everybody played their best on the same night at the same time, and that championship game is what we did. And I can tell you, that's never happened in my career. You usually have two or three that carry the load for you and you get by and you're good and all this. Can you think of one player that went on that floor that didn't do something good? Poa, she goes in and gets the two push-offs uh, on Clark. And she listened to the scouting report. I said, I'm going to work the referee. I said, every time she does this, you better fall. You better sell it. <laughs> <laughs> that was big. While it didn't put Clark on the bench, really. What did it do? It got in her head. It got in her head. Okay, I've never been guarded this way where they're selling it. Little things like that. There's the ever, I can go through the whole lineup and, and what kids did. Kateri Poole hits the big three and I look at the clock and I start bawling. It's over, baby. Um, yeah. Yes? No, no. <laughs> well, a typical day for me during the season would be we practice every day at 1.30. Um, 
I would say during the season every day we'll have staff meetings and go over practice plans. Um, and then I'll get some lunch and then I'll mosey on over to the PMAC. Getting up, I probably uh, wake up 7, 8, 9 o'clock, uh, but I'm not a deep sleeper. Um, I have a little notepad. I always keep notepad and a pencil next to my bed because in the middle of the night I'll think of something I didn't do or I need to do and I know if I don't write it down, even in the dark, I will forget it. I've learned to do that. If it is, think, God, I need to run this play for, I need to put this in, or I need to go speak here, I need to make a call here, I do that. How many of y'all do that? You, if you don't, you need to do it. Okay, it just, it's the aging process, I guess. I like to multitask. I, I, I like things done yesterday. See that PMAC over there? If they don't get that sucker built before I retire, I'm gonna give them holy hell. <laughs> It's time. That thing's 48 years old. It's dangerous in there. Don't grab a rail without holding on to somebody. I can say all this now. I've won the national championship, right? He's telling me, who in the hell has a name like Shard Richard? Right? But we do in Louisiana, and we love it, don't we? Thank you. North Louisiana is Billy Bob. They got two, wor they got two first names in North Louisiana. Right. Down here, we got all the Richards and the Boudreaux and the Thibodeaux. Rocket Man. Rocket Man. He says I have time for one more question. <laughs> then we're going to throw basketballs, Coach. Yes, ma'am. Um, drive, energy, that's a, you know, let me, guys, my parents didn't go to college. My grandmother had an eighth grade education. She was the smartest damn woman. She taught me more about God. She taught me more about life. I'd sit on the front porch with her, drinking those Barks root beer, and she'd get slabs of bacon. And she was a big woman. I'm telling you, I'd have to go over there every Sunday and help her put her girdle on. Do you even know what a girdle is? That's the truth. My sister would get in the front and I'd get in the back. One, two, three. Woo! <laughs> Memories. And I think back to what that woman taught me about right and wrong and the Bible. And then I think back to being brought up where I had parents who, they, they didn't even sign my report cards. Sign my name. Well, I, I, I made all A's, Dad. I made all A's, Mom. They knew it. What were they going to tell me? They didn't have to tell me anything. They showed their love to me. They showed it every day by supporting me, being in the stands. My parents were middle-income folks. Dad crawled under houses. He sprayed houses. My mother had, back in the day, you called them beauty shops, built on the end of the house. That's my life. And grew up out in the country. Pa grandparents owned a dairy farm. Uh, my dad joined the military. He's a Marine. To keep from having to pick strawberries and milk cows. <laughs> and I was born in Santa Ana, California. So I'm giving you a little background here on what makes you who you are. I think, one, you're born with some things, some traits, and then life's experiences make you who you are. And I always wanted to compete. I, I, you know, I graduated valedictorian, summa cum laude. Hell, these people around me, geniuses. But I outworked them. I stayed up just a little bit later so that they thought I was as smart as they were. And in competing, it made me feel good. Competing gave me a feel good. I'm gonna go back to integration. When we went to recess, guys, I was one of about 20 white kids in school. Half of them were in the welfare system. Now that's a true statement. And when we went out for recess, what'd we do? We played marbles, we threw tops, we played ball. I was always the first one the guys picked. And I thought, this makes you who you are. 
And I, I don't know how to say that somebody just drilled it in me or they were always on top. I think it was just things like that along the way in my life that just made me tough. The greatest compliment that you could ever give me, I finally got. And that was, Kim Mulkey is the toughest woman I have ever been around. Tough. Now that doesn't mean masculine. That doesn't mean uh, butchy looking. She's just tough. She's handled life's experiences in a way where you just pick yourself right back up. I used to have a sign in my office that said, put on your big girl panties and deal with it. <laughs> and that's what I do. And every one of us has pretty much the same obstacles in life. We really do. And you just keep living. You just keep on keeping on. Now, I have been blessed. Let's don't forget that. I have been blessed. But blessings come from putting yourself in a position to be blessed. That's the truth. My old grandma said this. If you waller with pigs, you come out smelling just like them. And I never wanted to waller with a pig. <laughs> That's the truth. I don't have baggage. I don't have baggage other than divorce. You're never going to see pictures of me and say, look at Kim, what she was doing at 18 years old. I didn't do that stuff. I was playing ball. My worst trait, I'm going to tell all of you here, don't put this on TV. <laughs> I got recruits coming in tomorrow. <laughs> And I'm not proud of it. So all you preachers out there, put me in your prayers. I like adjectives every now and then. OK? It just gets your point across just a little bit better. And I'm going to shut up. I'm going to shut up, OK? But y'all, I was at the largest Baptist university for 21 years. That's the funniest thing in the world to me. <laughs> this old country girl from South Louisiana, but I did grow up Baptist. They kicked me out of the church, so now I'm Methodist. <laughs> Catholics don't want any part of me because, you know, they're scared of me. No, I'm teasing. Um, but I used to tell Baptist jokes, and they loved me. They grew to love me there. And it goes like this, and then I'm going to hush. How many Baptists in here we got? You're in the minority down here, but go on and raise your hand if you're Baptist. <laughs> I know it. I get you. Okay. So the Baptists, they can be in church, and if they see a drunk guy walk in the back door, boy, they hop up and they escort him out, don't they? Oh, come on, babe. we got to get on out of this church, Okay. But you let a rich guy drunk with money walk in that back door and they make him a damn deacon. Y'all have a good day. <laughs>